Ladies and gentlemen, he's back. On today's episode, we are joined by the one and only Shano Gorman. So we chat about seemingly everything under the sun. We go into depth on temperature changes, depth changes, oxygen levels, light penetration, and how all of those affect both the bass's behavior and biology. All that and more on this episode of Tackle Talk. Hello, everybody. I'm Bill Dance, and you're listening to Tackle Talk. To the Tackle Talk Podcast, brought to you by American Legacy Fishing and Outdoors, world-class fishing gear, unmatched personal service. Now, here's your host, Andrew Hayes. Hey everybody, welcome back to the Tackle Talk Podcast. This fine program is made possible by the folks over at American Legacy Fishing. And right now we are smack dab in the middle of some insane sales that ALF has going on. They've had them for the past couple weeks and they've got them for the next few weeks coming up. But the biggest of them all might be starting tomorrow. So starting tomorrow, Wednesday, March 22nd through next Wednesday, March 28th, you get 40% back on a gift card with the purchase of any Dobbins rod, six cents rod, Abu Garcia Rod, Arc Rod, or Lose Rod. Any of those. If you buy anything from any of those brands, Dobbins, Six Cents, Abu Garcia, Arc, or Lose. If you buy rods from any of those, and you can do as many as you want, you're going to get 40% back on a gift card that a lot of people are actually using to build a whole combo. So if you want to do some math here, let's say that you buy like a Dobbins Champ XP, like a 734C for $270. bucks. you are going to immediately get back $108 on an American Legacy gift card that you can then use to buy whatever the heck you want. So that's a free Shimano SLX reel, right? A really cool like $99 reel. It looks really sweet with a blue champ xp that would look great you can go with a daiwa fuego or you could use it to take money off of your next purchase so if you want like a daiwa tatula if you add an extra 20 bucks you got a 109 dollar gift card add another like 20 bucks and you've got a tatula so you can do that with any six cents abu garcia arc lose or dobbins rods right now through next wednesday over to american legacy fishing basically a 40 percent rebate on your rod which is a killer deal so head over there right now and you guys know the drill if what you're looking for is not on sale it is now because you listen to the right show so we have the code tackle talk 10 that can save you 10 percent off almost everything on the site 10 percent off reels baits line other rods whatever you need we've got you covered tackle talk 10 over at www.americanlegacyfishing.com All right, folks, we have a great show for you today. It's a long one, as it always is, every time that this gentleman graces us with his presence. It is Shan the Man, Mr. Shan O'Gorman. And I know most of you know who Shan is by now, but if you don't, if you're new here, Shan is an aquatic biologist, and we've had multiple shows with him at this point over the years, and for good reason. And what I really, really enjoy about Shan is that he knows his stuff, he's passionate about fisheries management, but above all else, he doesn't sugarcoat things, he doesn't do this like whole mush mouth routine where he'll say one thing and then two seconds later he contradicts himself like unfortunately a lot of people in our industry do he doesn't do that he's a straight shooter and he talks about these things in terms that us regular folks can understand so no giant words he has really great analogies and metaphors that he uses to help you understand what he's talking about and he just gets right to the point so we've had Shan on a few times over the years as a standalone guest he also kicked off what ended up being probably my favorite project that we've ever done since the show started our four part series called The Bait Break breakdown. He's episode one of that. But today he's back to touch on a wide variety of topics that we actually hinted at in the intro, right? Depth changes, temperature changes, oxygen levels, light penetration, and more, and how each of those affects the bass, how it affects the forage, and how it ultimately should affect our approach as anglers. So with that, let's jump right into our conversation with Mr. Shan O'Gorman. All right, ladies and gentlemen, we are joined today. It is at aquatic underscore biologist on Instagram, aquatic biologist on Facebook. My man has a YouTube channel now. He's been on every podcast under the sun since he's been on here last time. It is everybody's favorite guest, Mr. Shan O'Gorman. Shan, thanks for coming back on, man. Oh, thanks for having me back on, man. I really enjoy it. So if anybody has lived under a rock for the past like two or three years, this is your, I think, fourth time on this show, I believe. Yeah, which is funny because I don't think we've had anybody on the show more than once, probably, except for maybe 
my buddy at Jig Masters twice, but I mean, you've been, this is fourth time and you are everybody's favorite guest because these are the fun episodes where we get to kind of dive into either scientific facts and sides of things or to kind of debunk a little bit and say, hey, these answers really aren't as cut and dry as sometimes we wish they were. So if it's okay with you, I got two topics I want to hit today. I want to hit temperature changes and I want to hit depth changes, if that's all right. Now, that sounds good. And we can talk a little bit about thermoclines and temperature gradient temp changes that way and lots of things. It gives me lots of ideas. Cool. So I kind of know, obviously, like if we want to start with temperature, what lures I like to throw at certain temperatures, I'd not probably in terms of a great grip on why scientifically or biologically these lures work at certain temperatures, but there's just certain things that as an angler you learn over 5, 10, 15, 20 years of what you're supposed to throw during certain seasons and what you're not supposed to throw during certain seasons. So I kind of want to work our way through from like January to December in terms of what a bass's annual cycle looks like with temperature and what that does to them. So let's start with wintertime. And I know wintertime for me is different than wintertime for you too. Down south, obviously, I'm up in Ohio, but we get these like brutal temperatures where you've got water temps in like the high 30s. You've got these fish. I know they're cold blooded, but they're predatory fish. I know you hear that they are lethargic. You hear they don't want to chase things. What does that type of temperature do to a predatory fish like a black bass when it's in these high 30s, low 40s temps? That's a real good question, man. So that, it's, you led, led yourself right into where I wanted to start. And that's um, kind of the biology of, of the fish and, and how, you know, how they relate to that. That's, a, that's the, kind of the most misunderstood thing. There's no difference in the fish. You know, the difference is in their metabolism. Because, so... Let's, let's think about it this way. A fish breathes through its gill. And that gill membrane is extremely thin, right? So oxygen can, can pass across it and, and oxygenate the blood. Well, there's a massive amount of heat loss there because it's so thin. Any, any of the, any of the um, blood that happened to be warmed in the fish and the muscle, as soon as it hits the gill, it's lost. That heat is lost. So the fish will basically be the same temperature as the water because of that heat loss okay now there are certain types of fish that have evolved to beat that like tuna tuna especially um they're amazing like their their blood their um their blood vessels look like a basket and that's called a reet r-e-t-e and so when the warm blood coming from the muscle is going back to the gill it's woven across the, the, the blood vessels coming back. So the heat transfers across and a tuna is actually like six or eight degrees warmer in the water than every other fish around it, which gives it a huge quick muscle twitch advantage. And that's why they crush the soles out of everything around them because they're actually warmer in the water. Bass, unfortunately, are freshwater fish. You know, they don't really have that. Um, there'll be reeds in different parts. Like sailfish have like reeds in their brain. And they don't even really know why. At least I don't know why. I don't remember them telling me why. Um, uh, obviously, it'd be to an advantage to have their brain a little bit warmer, right? But, um, you know, that is kind of nature's way of ev evolution, trying to combat that heat loss at the gill. So, <coughs> excuse me. Um, we have to remember that our bass are going to be there i kind of just when i use temperature i'm thinking about that as far as like how active will that fish be right um but then there's always like the kind of the like so you hear the winter slow down slow down slow down but you can also we all know like through experience with quick quick pause baits like jerk baits you can you can in, in, entice a strike right well, yep. now you're hitting on an instinct that's very much like a cat playing with like a feathered toy. Okay. It's not really hitting that to eat it. Or it's a cat's really not, the cat might not even feel like playing, but if you twitch that toy in front of it, it'll jump, right? That's what the bass is doing. You twitch that bait in front of it and it'll, it, it just, it's an instinct, you know? So it's not really a feeding response. You're getting with a jerk bait in the winter. You're getting a, a, you know, a strike response or a reaction strike. As some people call that, you know? Um, and I, that's important to understand the difference between the two. If you're on a feeding bite in the winter, it's probably going to be slow. They're probably going to barely pick it up. 
you're barely going to feel that jaw close, probably going to be dragging on the bottom jig, super large swim bait, whatever your choice of weapon there. Whereas the feeding strike is going to, or the, or the reaction strike is going to be the reaction strike, much like the summertime. Bang, and it's on, you know, it's a kind of an aggressive thing. But I kind of differentiate those two behaviors. I'm either dragging extremely slow or I'm out there at the reaction strike with the jerk bait. And I, I do go to the jerk bait quite a lot. So something you hit on there, which is interesting too, is like all of these reaction strike baits that we end up throwing in the wintertime, which is jerk baits, blade baits around here are a huge deal in the wintertime. You're hitting on the fact that if I'm going out and I'm trying to hit that reaction strike, they're all treble baits. Because again, you're right. They're not going and engulfing that. They're not getting a size four aught hook in their mouth. They're just swiping at it. And you're catching so many of these fish with like, yeah, they might have a corner pinned around their mouth, but I mean, it's like side of the face is where you're mm-hmm. getting a lot of these fish at. So that's kind of the, something I've always tried to tell people around here. And that goes to like, we'll get to this later, I'm sure too, but that goes to all year long where if you want to throw big baits, you can throw big baits. They just have to be trebled baits because you just have to, you know, piss that fish off enough that it wants to take a swipe at it. It doesn't have to get the whole darn thing. It doesn't have to get a whole eight inch HUD down its throat or something. It's just got to take a swipe. Right. And so the other thing that I think we see around here a lot of times in the wintertime, when you get these extreme cold temperatures, and this might be more playing on what you talked about with like a cat and a toy, is we see success with vertical jigging. Like vertical jigging in the wintertime kills. Obviously, it's like a necessity when you're ice fishing because you're fishing through a hole and you don't have a choice. But even if you were on a boat, right, a lot of these people are catching these vertical jigging fish is that because when you have that reaction strike you're still not making that fish chase anything you can just kind of draw it in and then you are you're right you're in a contained area where it's up and down and they can strike without all of this effort of going and chasing a chatter bait chasing a crank bait chasing a swim bait that's blowing by them i think yeah you that's a great point you're hitting on there i mean you, you still kind of have to hit them in the nose with it. you know what i mean you, they're not going to come like they come from, you know, long distances to chase something, but the vertical, um, pattern, uh, in the ice, you know, I kind of stole that, um, from up North. I did some fishing up there, you know, many years ago, but they did a lot of vertical jigging, like you said, and we don't do any really hardly like in Georgia. Like even, I didn't learn about that. I learned about that up North, you know? Yeah. I, I realized real quickly, and this might help some of the tournament guys, um, I'll go to vertical patterns on high pressure lakes in the summertime because they don't see them. And summertime is again one of those places you can find those fish and they're not super mobile. It's one of the two times a year, I think, winter and summer, where those fish are like they found their spot and they're in the spot. And so once you find them, you it's just like a guessing game, really, to like you said, bonk on the head basically and just find the area where you want a vertical jig. Yes. And the, you want those suspended fish, that's a good a good pattern to be on if you can get above them and know what depth they're at. But I think they kind of get accustomed. It seems to me like I kind of noticed it in my ponds, you know, my small lakes and ponds, because some of them would be managed for, you know, for fishing. And there's a, a, a community of people who would be really into the fishing that live there. But many of them were not. Many of them weren't managed for fishing at all. They're just managed to look good, you know. And the ones that, I noticed that, that you could go to vertical patterns. Although I think the bass get accustomed to the lures kind of coming at them. Like if you thought, think about a wheel and how the cast works, you looked at it from the side, it looks like a wheel, right? Kind of an oblong, like an oval shape, right? It goes out, it goes down, it goes around. They get used to that and they don't hit it. But as soon as you change your pattern, go to vertical falls, you start catching tons of fish on those private waters because there's not, the, the pressure's not there. All you have to do is, kind of be better than the guys who were there, not all the guys in Ohio or Georgia or wherever you are, you know, <laughs> right. public, like, you know, um, and I've noticed that like you could, you could, you could just go to like a, like a simple lizard, a weightless Texas rig and just let it fall and they'll hit it. You know, I, it's just, you know, the things you notice when you work on lakes. So at these low water temperatures, and again, a lot of this we're going to talk about today is relative because my low water temperatures are different than your low water temperatures, and I understand that. But when you're in like a a winter pattern, right, and these fish, wherever they are, that cold water is also relative to them. So if you're in Georgia, you know, I don't know what your water temps are, but like a 50 degree water temp could be freezing to that fish where up here they're starting to get like pre-spawn at that point, but it's all relative. But when they're in these kind of like more lethargic, more um, low metabolism type times of year, like winter time, do you think that size of forage matters? And if so, 
I see two arguments for this. Like on one hand around here, we downsize all the time because it's just kind of like dumb lizard brain says, oh, this fish doesn't want to eat. So a smaller bait is going to have a better chance of getting eaten. That's why we're dragging these little Ned rigs and stuff. But on the other hand, I can see the argument for if that fish wants to have the least amount of effort that it has to exert for the most reward, a big, dumb, slow glide bait or swim bait or something big that will hold it over for longer could be a better fit. So do you have an opinion on that either way on what they look for when the water's cold? I don't know if that has anything to do with cold. I'm not sure. Um, but I do favor larger baits and that's hitting on a different kind of an instinct, but look very much like the reaction strike instinct we were just talking about. I don't really know if there's a fancy term for it, but I've heard very much kind of an it's worth it instinct. You know, um, they instinctively know that that larger meal is more beneficial to them. Um, larger bass especially are, are exceptionally good at it. Um, you don't see the large bass, like even here, like you can, if you're shiner fishing, and you're fishing with a small shiner, you're generally not going to catch a big bass on it. You need a big shiner. Um, yeah, I'm not saying they never eat small shiners. But the, the biggest fish that I've caught so far, shiner fishing, have come off bigger shiners. And it's keying on that. It's worth it instinct, you know. So I like to think about it this way. If you're fishing a large bait quickly, pausing, quickly pausing, quickly pausing, you're hitting on two different types of instincts. You're hitting on it's worth it and you're hitting on reaction, right? And I think when you start stacking those things in your favor, I mean, it's kind of like poker. Is it winning strategy? Probably not. But you're giving the probability to yourself to give yourself a better chance at winning, right? Um, I think of fishing kind of like baseball. It's more of a game of failure than it is a game of success. You're going to lose a lot more days than you win, right? So I try to put all the, the probability in my favor. I can't. I think those two things kind of go hand in hand. And I'm not saying that I don't downsize, you know, uh, you, you got to sometimes you're all over the place. I'm all over. I'll throw the tackle box at them. If I'm not catching anything, I'm switching everything up, you know? Um, but yeah, and there's different parts of the country too, that seem to be like, you you talk about downsizing a lot. I think Ohio is one of them. Um, it, maybe it has to do with like what types of forage you're dealing with. Um, it's, it's downsizing seems to work really well. Certain places, you know, I've noticed that. So as we make our way out of winter and we start to go to more of this like pre-spawn patterns, around here it seems to be like 50 to 55 degrees is really when these fish kind of start to get a little bit more active. They start making their way toward these like spawning areas and pockets on these lakes. Do you think that instinct of that fish like coming out of winter mode and into pre-spawn mode, is that like a, a day where everything just snaps or do you think that's more of like a gradual transition for these fish? Like, is there, everybody wants this magic number and I, I personally don't think there is one, but I could definitely be wrong. Yeah. I don't, I don't think there is either. Um, I think the weather people want, people press me on that a lot. Like they want me to, they want me to put it on a bass on a, on a schedule. They want to put 68 degrees bass spawn, you know, and that's not how it is at all. Um, most of the, again, let's do let's the probability. If I say bass spawn at 68 degrees, they'll probably do that like 70% of the time, you know, that other 30% of the time you're going to give crazy weather patterns that are going to bump the spawn off, and, you know, and it, maybe it's really warm and they spawn early. Maybe it's really cold and they get pushed off the bed. Um, you know, females can hold their eggs for 60 days across the spring. They don't have to. It's not an emergency situation that they spawn and females also spawn in multiple nests. They don't drop all their eggs in one nest. That's a kind of a myth that goes around. Um, the big females especially will, will, will spawn in multiple nests and can spawn over large periods of time. And I've even seen like in my ponds where you get most, most of the spawning occurs like April, but then you still see fish on a bed in like June. Mm -hmm. You know, like, what is he doing? You know? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But well, this, this gets to that conversation of like, not every bass can be put in the same box. Like no. some bass have different personalities. Some bass have different tendencies. Some bass have different genetics. Like there's all these things that go into this equation of there is no 68 degree and boom, this happens type of thing. Um, but you just said something interesting. So you said bass can hold their eggs for 60 days. So yeah. 
is it possible where the weather can be too volatile or the water temp can be too volatile where that whole 60 day window is missed and then that fish doesn't spawn? And if so, what happens to those eggs? They just dissolve or they get put out, but they're not fertilized. I'm not sure. I would imagine, I would imagine they would probably dump them just not be fertilized, but they could be reabsorbed, you know, as nutrients, but they, they could do that. But it could happen. Sure. Yeah. Oh yeah. It did happen. I saw it happen once. Um, in the 2000s, maybe around 07, 08, we had a season. They didn't spawn at all. They didn't spawn at the fish hatchery. They didn't spawn for me anywhere. Um, and I talked to the guys who were smarter than me about it, and they didn't know. Uh, just kind of put their hands up. It's how it works. They didn't have any bass to sell that year. And one of my ponds I had was going to stock that season. I had to let it go the whole season, um, you know, just let it fill up with bluegill and, and stock. It was fine, you know. Um, it actually, it's okay. You know, I wouldn't, I'm not in a mad panic that the bass don't they'll spawn every year. Um, they generally spawn too much. Uh, most of my recommendations, you know, in Georgia were to tell people to harvest bass, um, not to stock any bass. They want to stock so many fish all the time and they think it's doing good for the lake, but it's not. Yeah, it's definitely possible that you can miss a spawn. It's also possible they spawn twice, once in the spring and once in the fall. That's something that I think probably is a little bit more common down by where you are. We don't get that too much, but I know that like my parents, you know, live down in Florida for a lot of the year and they see fish spawn twice every once in a while. Yeah, it happens. So I don't know, really know how to phrase this question, but it's just from what I've seen in the past. I've definitely caught fish around here at lakes where it's during spawn. That fish is either bloody tailed up. It's about to pop like it's spawn ready to go. But I've caught them in places where there is definitely no bed like on a big rock point on a big rock pile on something where they just seem so far away from where they should be and where they're spawning mm-hmm. will fish leave that bed at some point to go feed or to go hunt because i've definitely caught fish in a place where it's just like you shouldn't be here right now I, I get that a lot too and that's the part where people confuse what shallow water means okay they think every single bass in the lake is up there in 18 inches of water built, making a bet spawning and that is not how it is because they have avian predators to worry about generally the fish that are up really that tight on the bank are immature fish that don't know what they're doing because they access themselves to you don't usually see a nine pound bass laying with its back up out of the water it's going to be off in six or eight feet of water on one of those beds. <laughs> well we don't have she's nine pound bass choose, anyway so we don't have to worry about that <laughs> <laughs> she's gonna choose the bed that doesn't expose her to the birds yeah right um i mean there's 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 eagles i saw six bald eagles today and you know, the bass are not as shallow is six feet, eight feet, even 10 feet. Um, is your lake 200 feet deep? Then shallow is 25 feet. You know, um, it's relative. And we're, and, and when we start talking about temperature and we've already kind of touched on it, it's relative between Georgia and Ohio, it's relative in temperatures. It's, you know, it's, 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 there's a lot of variables, you know, and you can't just, put everything into a box like that, like black and white. It's, this is how it is because it's not how it is. Um, it's important to understand how it is and understand all this numbers and say, Hey, we've got the 65 or 50. You mentioned that 55 degree water temperature. One thing that popped into my head on that one, when 55 hits those crawfish come out, that's their spawning kick, kick there. So that fifth, when I see five, five, I'm thinking crawfish patterns because they should be creeping around crawling. And those crawfish are kind of weird. You know, they don't, they're not spitting out crawfish babies till later. They're literally just spawning, just, just collecting sperms and eggs. And that's all, there's no babies going everywhere. So, you know, you can stay, it's the adults, you know, it's the bigger crawfish that are coming out at 55. And like your, the last podcast, I got so much good information from the, um, the bait, the crawfish guy. I, yeah. I listen Zach to that three, yeah, four he's, times. He's, yeah, yeah, I love that. <laughs> if, listen, go, if you haven't listened to that, go back and get that. I got so much listening to him, you know. I don't want to even disrespect him. Just go listen to him. I won't talk about crawfish anymore. <laughs> but that, I, just, that, when you said 55, you know, that's, that, that's the first thing that's coming out. And, that, and, and that's a good thing to be aware of. Um, and then you get up into the 60s and you'll start getting the bass. They'll get the crappy first if you have those. And then the bass will come on, and then the bluegill should be after them. Um, bluegill are monthly spawners everywhere in the country. When the water temperatures are about 70, they start. And when they drop below 70, they stop. However many months you have above 70 is how many spawns you'll get out of your bluegill. 
And that's why they're the best sunfish to have um, because they just, they can replace themselves during the growing season where mm. a crappy spawns in the spring. Oh, they, people throw it at me all the time. Well, crappier forage too. Yeah, they are, but they don't replace themselves. So if you have a population that's predominantly crappy forage, it runs out and it runs out before the fall gets there. So what you'll see is bass that are heavy on poor forage lakes, whether they're crappy or green sunfish or whatever competitors you have, you'll see bass that are really long and skinny because they'll have forage at the beginning of the season and they'll run out by the fall. Yeah, your refresh rate's not there. It's not. And bluegill just consistently pump, 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 pump fish in there. So you know, bluegill are definitely the best. Um, and whenever I see lakes that are chock full of small green sunfish and crappy, I don't even fish them. All right, everybody, we'll get back to Shannon in just a second. But first, let me tell you, I spent the past better part of like two days planning, placing, drilling, running wires, sealing, and laying out my brand new electronic setup in my kayak. And when it was all said and done, the final piece was to add, of course, a battery. And the battery that I hooked up to that and trust running everything all year long is Dakota Lithium. Now, to be honest, I'm hooking up quite a bit of stuff to this one single battery, and it takes it like a champ. Forward-facing sonar, side imaging, down imaging, mapping, all of it is drawing off of one single Dakota lithium and being a kayak guy that single Dakota lithium can't weigh 70 pounds like some of these other AGM batteries do no sir this little blue box right here in this battery is going to weigh like one sixth of that and that's because Dakota lithium batteries are under half the weight of the other guys they're twice the power they charge five times faster and they last four times longer than traditional batteries so stop messing with batteries that you have to look at and maybe change every year or you get a little iffy on them just get a battery that's built to last and has an 11 year warranty and US based customer support. And then, no matter what you need, if you need a $100 battery or you need a $1,000 battery, we're here to save you 10% off your entire order with code TACKLETALK10 at checkout. Yep, 10% off a battery that doesn't normally get discounted because it doesn't need to, but that's what we're here to do. We're here to save you money. We've got you covered. So head over to www.dakotalithium.com and save 10% off the best in the business by using code TACKLETALK10. All right, let's get back to our conversation with Shano Gorman. So as we move past spawn and we start to get into this post-spawn time frame where, again, temps are still heating up and it's, again, all relative to where you're at. But, you know, you're getting in the 60s. You're starting to get into like summertime and early summer kind of. What happens to a fish's body during spawn to the point where, like, I've seen some poor fish that look like they were put through a meat grinder after spawn where it's just like these fish are tired it was a grueling process they're worn out what are they doing after post-spawn and how long is that recovery process i think it depends on the balance of the fishery a lot of poor fish get that spawned out label when they're not spawned out they're starving okay and that's where we go back to like the relative weight calculation like what was the what's the fish's weight versus its length um it should not be pounds underweight if it's a little if it's beat up if it's if it's you know it's got loose skin if it's got a sores on its tail if it's got bacterial infections that kind of thing that's all normal with with spawning but if it's a if it's after the spawn and it's a two, it's it's two pounds underweight under its standard weight um like i have my weight charts right here right so we've all seen this thing before, right? Let's look at the, the 20. I know like right here, right? a 20 inch bass. If, if I'm at 4.5 pounds on a standard weight, this is like the BMI chart of the doctor, right? It's just, that's what a bass at 20 inches should weigh. That's what science says. Let's not try to break down how they came to it, but they're right. All right. Cause I know they're right. I've been doing this for 30 years. If that bass weighs like 3.5 pounds, there's a serious problem. That's not spawning. Okay. Um, because that bass should be 5.2 pounds in a healthy situation. And then it bulks up for the spawn. It'd be six pounds. And then it loses a pound of egg weight. It's still back to 4.5 pounds. It's still at its BMI, right? If it's 3.5 pounds, it's a forage issue, not a spawning issue. And I can't tell you that nobody on YouTube understands that. It's always spawned out. That's just the excuse the group think gives it because they don't understand fisheries balance and what they're looking at what you're looking at when you see something that poor is something that started out underweight before the spawn and now the spawn has really raked it because it didn't 
have the body weight that it needed to spawn. And that's where you get death around spawning. So, yeah, it's the spawn is just accentuating other problems usually. And that's why it's so easy to see in certain fisheries. Like, you're right. I'm thinking of certain ones around here. There's only maybe one or two lakes around here I can think of where that relative chart is right, where those fish are on the dot. I mean, I've never caught there's certain lakes where I've never caught a 20 inch fish that was under four and a half, probably 4.6, 4.7. But most of them around here, if you get a line burner 20, it's going to go like 3.8. Yeah. 3.75. Like, cause they're just not super healthy fisheries around here, obviously. Yeah. But you're right. I, I guess the ones where I've seen these fish that I've always called so spawned out have never been those lakes. Mm-mm. Come you to think of it. Right? I've never put that pattern together before, see, but you, yeah. see <laughs> you'll never see it there. And those lakes are your healthy lakes. Those lakes are where you're going to bust your PB. You're right. That, those, those are half, the lakes. Yeah. That have, yeah. Those are the lakes <laughs> yeah. that have, you at least have the chance to do it. Right. You go to the other lake that's where the fish are two pounds light and they're 24 inches long and they should weigh eight. They're going to weigh six. It's a tough place to bust a PB. Yeah. That malnourished fish that you already knew is malnourished. You just made it run a marathon during spawn. Of course, it's going to look like a skeleton by the time the thing's it done. looks yeah, it looks like a skeleton. And when you get into those skeleton, the, the, their heads are so huge and their bodies can fit back through their mouth. You know, it looks like if their body looks like a triangle behind it, you know, that is not spawning stress. That is starvation. That's called your normal Ohio fish. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so obviously, as we get out of post spawn, we start to go into these summer patterns. And the thing that everybody always says, summer fish are deep, summer fish are deep, summer fish go deep. And I think to a certain point, that's correct. But I'll let you touch on this a little bit. I know for a fact, there are spots in our lakes where it can be the hottest day in the summer. There's not a single fish in this area of the deepest part of the lake. And I'm sure part of that has to do with thermocline. Part of that has to do with where fish are and aren't going to be this time of year. But how deep will fish go during summertime? How deep will you see them go relative to obviously where they were during spawn? And can you dispel some of those myths about that just in the summertime go to the deepest part of the lake? Because I don't think that's right. They don't always do that. And again, we're getting into like, again, do the fish go deep in the summer? Yes. Do all the, the probability says 70% of the time? Yes, they are deep in the summer. But there are fish that never leave the shallows. Okay? I've seen the studies. I actually just saw a real good one on YouTube. There, I can't remember what it was called, but there's go look up. Like, there's a study about tracking fish. Like, uh, what was I can't. Uh, I just saw it. They, they tagged fish and they tracked them. It looked like an old TV antenna you set on top of your house. They could point it around the lake, and they could go find for the fish rat. And one of the eight-pound bass they tagged never left two feet of water. Just a never. resident shallow fish, yeah. Stayed there. And some of the fish would go to the ex- – some of the fish were gone. You know, some of the fish just disappeared. And some of the fish would go to two specific places. And they weren't always, like, exactly where you thought. Like, many of them would be, like, on isolated stuff set on shallow water flats with nothing else around them. Yeah. You know? And one thing I just picked up was one of those crazy, my buddy sold it to me, um, the radar, the sonar that sees the fish live. Panoptics. Oh, you got like forward facing. You got like yeah. live scope. I, yeah, I just put live scope on the boat. So, yeah, I'm, I, what I'm really interested in with that is to, just exactly what we're talking about there. Where are these fish at? Um, because, because of that and because of my experience, I know that study is dead on accurate. Um, there are some fish that just don't, that just, especially the bigs, like the, I had places in life, in my pond, I had a four acre pond one time and there was one spot down by the dam in the corner. There was nothing really there. Like I could see on the depth finder. It was like eight feet deep. I, there may be a secondary point. I mean, like a two foot little bump out you know, on the edge of the lake right there, but there was really not much there. Um, but it always held big fish. But it never held the same big fish. Like, I never electrofished the same fish twice off that spot. I have done that a few times, but I never did that because it would be too much difference in weight. You know what I mean? You get one seven pounds one year, and the next year, you know, it would be one like nine and a half that completely didn't look like that fish. You know, it couldn't have been that seven. And then the next year, you pull an eight out that you've never seen. And all, like, you tell the guy with the net, just get ready because the big fish is about to come up. Like, they, they, they have, you know, fishermen know they have holes. And, and I think that that really pertains to those bigs because they can do what they want. 
you know, it's like Debo. <laughs> yeah. I have this theory in the rivers too, where we see this all the time, where the best spots, like there will be resonant fish that sit in that eddy for years, it seems like, because that mm-hmm. is just, it's the alpha smallmouth in that spot. There's one spot in that eddy where they can sit and it's a bait buffet and they're going to chase all those little squeakers out. And they're like, no, I've been here for seven years. Like this is my spot. Go find mm-hmm. somewhere else. You see this with, um, trout a lot too. I think like brown trout where it's just their hole. There's one alpha brown trout in that hole, the big buck beak, you know, mm-hmm. seven pound brown trout. And he's like, Nope, I've been here for five years. Like this is my spot. You all can go up and down the lake or up and down the river and you can go shallow and deep or whatever. This is mine. And so we see that sometimes too, but you hit on something cool, which I saw in another study too. I don't think it's the same one you're talking about, but it was a tracking study. And they found that so many of these fish had two spots where they would go back and forth and back Mm -hmm. and forth. And they would, and like basically their annual track would be along this straight line from point to point. And depending on what time of year, they would be on that line somewhere, but it was just their roamers and they have their two favorite spots. Do you see that from time to time too, of these fish that just seemingly have a point A and point B programmed in their head? Yeah, I think they do, man. And I I think food's going to drive them, you know, and when those spots just like you just said, are spots where they're eating, you know, and they're going to go back to it because they've been fed there. You would too, you know, it's, it's not rocket science. Um, but what I find interesting about that is none of those fish in any of those studies were all doing the same things. They all had kind of a different thing going, you know, and it really made me think like, you know, you've got to, you got to open your mind up a little bit and think kind of outside your experience and outside the things. And, and I, I'm really looking for like one guy asked me a real good question on the page about what, what's the bass behavior when the water is stained versus when it's not stained, like when it's clear, I don't know, you know, do they act like it's at night all the time? Are they loose off the structure? I don't know, but with, hopefully with forward facing, I'll, I'll get a better, maybe, maybe be able to see something like that. So around here, just from years of fishing, there's a difference of how fish will act in stained water based on if it's like, if that's the norm or if it's not the norm. So if it's not the norm, like if they're in a river system and it floods out and it goes crazy, our fish just hunker down. Like they find a place, they find some boulder to sit behind or something and they just hunker down and they wait for the thing to be over. Or they go up in like, you know, weeds that weren't normally underwater that are now underwater where they can just get out of the main current so that they can survive through this three-day flooding event, and then they just go right back to whatever they were doing. Seems to be their pattern in the river. But then in lakes, like the one of the lakes I was talking about, actually, one of the better ones, is just a stained, gross lake. And it's always stained and gross. That's how it is in the middle of summer when we haven't had rain for four weeks. It doesn't matter. And those fish are so used to that stained water that you can throw like crystal clear baits at them and they don't care. Like that you don't need the blacks and blues. You don't need the dark colors. They they'll eat anything because that is their norm. And they've been so conditioned to hunt in dirty water, which is cool. Yes. Yes. And I've seen that as well. So is there such thing as too deep in the summertime? Sure. Um, now you get into lake size. Okay. And this is where people get confused. Um, ponds are not lakes. Okay. And they're not managed the same way. And they don't kind of work the same way. Like in a, if you're going to build a pond in your backyard, I would tell you don't dig it deeper than eight feet deep. Now in the North, maybe you want a little more depth for the ice, you know, maybe 10, 12 feet, you know, maybe some, some protection from the, from the cold, but that would be the only reason we don't have ice here. So we don't even need it. So I'd tell my guys six, eight feet is all the water depth you need in a pond because the water in a smaller body of water will stratify. You'll get a thermocline a lot shallower in a pond than you will in a major reservoir. Like back home, the Lake Lanier was very clear, 30,000 or so acres, 45 feet deep is the thermocline. And in big lakes, you even get oxygen under thermocline. It's confusing, but in ponds, you generally don't get oxygen under that thermocline enough to support fish. In lakes, you will. But the point being is the, the oxygen is, the oxygen levels start to drop around 45 feet in Lake Lanier. They're going to drop around six feet in one acre pond. If you have, I don't care if you have a 400 foot deep one acre pond, you're going to have oxygen six feet deep. The 394 feet below that won't have any fish. There's no oxygen down there. It's not a lake. Right? So 
it's all relative. It's very subjective. You know, it's very like, where are you? Um, like one thing I'm noticing here in Florida, like people automatically assume these fish are so hot. These fish are, these, there's, they're in a hot climate, right? There's super hot temperatures. They're accustomed. And actually what I'm starting to notice is, and, and it's really starting living in Florida and having stocked these Florida bass all these years is really starting to make sense. Florida bass don't live in hot environments. There are so many springs here. The water temperature is 70 degrees all the time. Okay. In the winter, in the summer, it doesn't matter. Right. It's 78 degrees out there right now. I just got off this afternoon, <laughs> you know? Okay. There are springs that, then that stabilizes the water temperature. Right. So when we doing the, and I've seen it in ponds everywhere. When you see the Florida, when you see a cold snap bump onto, onto your Florida fish, they shut down. They do not like temperature change. Right. And now I'm starting to understand why, because they, they evolved in a place that the water temperature doesn't change that much. Florida is not, the water temperature is not that hot. Right. It's very, it's very standard. <laughs> just it's even very, keel. Yeah. It's very even keel. Now I'm saying, I'm not saying the water temperatures don't fluctuate. They absolutely do. But if you were to look at a pond or you were to look at a 10, uh, like Rodman's right behind me right now, 10,000 acre lake at Rodman Reservoir and look at the average water temperature of that lake, it's going to be considerably flatter and, and more stable than the same size lake in Georgia, north of here, because they don't have eight springs pouring 50 million gallons of water in them every day. Huge difference, you know, um, and that temperature. So, again, that's something I just realized about temperature in the last two months, you know, and that's what's cool about fishing, man. You just never quit learning and thinking about stuff like that, you know. So you get to a point where like all summer long, especially around here, right, your temp of your water is climbing, climbing, climbing. At some point, you hit this point where it's starting. It's not crazy, but it starts to gradually fall, obviously, around you. Does that have a different effect on fish than it does around here? Because around here, you start to get that, you know, we call it the fall feed bag, right? Where they just hit. And it, it seems to be like a day where I was making the argument earlier that in pre-spawn, I think it's very gradual. I think these fish just, you know, kind of slowly start to get into their, their pre-spawn ways and there's no magic temperature. Around here, it seems like there will just be one day in the fall where everything just goes bananas and these fish go bonkers and they're bonkers for the next like two, three, four weeks. Do you guys have that down there too? Or since your temperature is so standard, you don't see that as much. It's probably not as, as pronounced as what you're seeing, but we do see that sometimes. Um, yeah, it's very similar. Um, I had something, I, I, I just had a thought and it left my head about temperature. Oh, in the summertime, just to touch on that. One thing that we need to talk about on temperature there is, um, Again, where you are and, and be aware of what you've got going on in the lake. Let's say as, as water heats up, it loses its affinity to hold oxygen. So what that means is the hotter the water, the less the oxygen. So when you get super hot and super weedy, you've got a dangerous situation because those weeds consume oxygen at night. People don't realize that. Re plants respire at night. Trees make oxygen in the daytime. They use it at night. They don't use as much at night as they use as they produce in the daytime. It's a net, net, net positive oxygen production thing. That's why they they produce oxygen for the planet. But they can they respire at night. Plants respire at night. So when you have a lake that's chock full of weeds in the heat of the summer, the lowest oxygen levels with the highest oxygen demand, you've got a serious problem. Huh. That's interesting. Yeah, I'm trying to think like. I mean, I guess the the ponds and the lakes that I do well night fishing at aren't weedy lakes. So I guess that probably makes a little bit of sense. Interesting. Is that why, obviously, like, because these ponds, especially, right, where you're going to try and fish them in July and late July, it's like you have to drag a, you know, a black worm like it's going this much every hour, right? It's just the most painful type of fishing ever. Is it just because the oxygen is so low and that's why we think fish get... You know, they slow down and get more lethargic in the summer. Well, I'm not sure about that, but I told you that to tell you this. Does it make sense now why fish go deeper in the summer? To get away from the weeds? Think about it more. It's colder water. Has more oxygen. It's a more comfortable place to breathe. But then there's just those outliers of those just like gross nine-year-old fish. They're just don't like, care. I don't care. <laughs> right? <laughs> They're struggling. I like it here. <laughs> 
So your yeah, smart so, fish yeah. are going deep. Yeah, your your fish that you know any of your fish that are higher oxygen requirement fish are going deep too, uh, like, like trout. That's, that's what makes cold water fish are cold water fish. Cold water fish means high oxygen requirement fish. So things like bluegill that stay relatively shallow for a lot of the time, right? They just don't care either. They don't consume as much oxygen or they just, they're No, fine. they're just, they're, they're just maybe probably a little better suited to, to deal with the heat and the, they, you know, they, they just, they don't, it doesn't bother them, you know, um, they'll stay shallow until literally until you get under four parts for me and then the fish just die. They suffocate. It cracks me up that a fish like a bluegill that's such a vulnerable species in a lake or whatever just hangs out in, like, the most vulnerable spots. Like, yeah, I know they hang out on, like, structure and stuff, too, but, I mean, especially in the summertime, like, you'll just be in the middle of the lake or you'll be, you know, over on the bank and you'll just see bluegill this far under the water just swimming exposed, don't care about anything. Like, they just, they're so stupid sometimes. <laughs> well, they're very young, you know, and they're, and there's a lot of them born, fortunately, because <laughs> they need to be. Um, but, you know, what that's another great point too because you know that's what makes a bluegill such good forage um for bass because they they're they inhabit the same areas you know um blueback herring not such a good forage for largemouth bass they don't inhabit the same areas right so um that's a good um, blueback herring to be good for like you know a spotted bass or schooling fish striper you know something out there like that they're not good forage um and you now that's why, like, that's how the scientists kind of figured it out. Like our stocking strategies that I use are not, they're not, they're, they're, they're science driven stuff. They're research projects done by scientists. You know, this has been proven by science that, you know, these are the fish that you want to stock into a pond. And I think too, where a lot of people get confused when I'm talking is like, I'm talking about man-made ponds. That's what I, that's what I manage. And then they want to start throwing the great lakes at me. I'm like, I'm not talking about that. <laughs> you know what I mean? Listen, One man. Yeah. Brought up marlin, you know what I mean? I'm like, I, I'm sorry, but the way you manage a pond is not the way you manage a marlin population in the middle of the ocean. <laughs> not the same thing. You have to pay me way more to manage the ocean, man. Right? Not my job, bro, but that's not right. <laughs> So this is a question I think you might at least have an idea on. So when our fish go into their fall mode and that temp starts dropping in the fall and they do get into this like feeding frenzy really around here, how much food can a bass put away in one day? Because around here, this is the time of year where like if you want to break your personal best, it's fall around here. It's not spring. It's fall. Yeah. But these yeah. fish just balloon up like crazy and they'll eat with 12 things still in their gullet and they don't care how much weight relative to the fish can a fish eat in a day i i it, it'll eat what it'll it can fill like we had well, i used to do a, a research project with a guy getting a phd and like uh it was something to do about gis studies and uh, how watershed affects biodiversity of fishes and we sampled fish all up 70 no 34 35 streams twice a season so 70 times we sampled fish. Well, one of the times we sampled fish, um, very rare for us to have them in Georgia anymore or anywhere near Georgia. I don't know. We might've been in North Carolina at that point, but um, we, we caught a very small, small mouth in the electric fish in, in sample. And, you know, that's something very rare for us. That's very normal for you, but very, we were just like going nuts. We kept them alive in a five gallon bucket all weekend. We had little fish in there for him to eat. We took him home. We have my buddy, fisheries guys always have aquariums, you know, so we had plenty You're of like, aquariums. We got one. <laughs> yeah, we, we want to watch him. And so we put him in the aquarium, right? Well, my buddy puts him into an aquarium with a, like a nine inch clown knife. And I'm like, that is two things like that two, have never usually met before. <laughs> two, three, two, three inch, you know, uh, uh, small mouth bass and with a clown knife, he's going to get eaten, bro. He's like, well, I don't think he's going to eat him. I'm like, I think he's going to eat him. I think the clown knife's going to jack him, you know? Oh, was I wrong? Oh, my <laughs> God, was I wrong? It took about two days for that small mouth to figure out. And there was some other fish in the tank too, you know, some algae eater fish and whatever. I don't even remember, but there was some fish in the tank. He, he figured out that the, the, the food that we were dropping in came from the top when that lid opened up. No, dude, the first two feet of that tank with that small mouse, he got a running start. I saw him do it. He got a running start, hit that clown knife in the gill, headbutted him, killed him. First thing he did was kill that clown knife. Three, four inch smallie, jacked him. 
And then you start putting, you start putting, uh, you put goldfish or, or, you know, whatever we get feeder goldfish or we get bluegill that we sign up from one of the school's ponds, you know, whatever. Um, nah, bro. Every, all of them. He would open his mouth, two would swim out, he'd eat another one. His belly, you know, belly full of marbles is what he looked like he had. He'd literally eat gorge, gorge, just like. And won't stop. Yeah. Won't stop like a drug addict. Yeah. Will not. Will absolutely not. So how much will they eat? They will physically eat until they they die. I mean, they just, they won't stop. You explained why all of us up here eat, sleep, and breathe smallmouth right there. Because that's just, they're a whole different beast. I caught one in a creek maybe, I don't know, three years ago. And this thing, I mean, when I say fingerling, this sucker was like probably two inches long, three inches long, maybe. It's probably pretty similar to yours it just this tiny little thing i put him in a ziploc bag i took him home i put him in my aquarium here i had like a just a little i don't know what was 10 15 gallon aquarium or something and then the very next day i went to PetSmart and i bought two dozen of those little like nine cent goldfish and put them in there and that sucker did not stop chasing until all 24 were eaten yep same thing i mean just and and you looked at it and he was he was wider than he was long because it was just mm-hmm. The belly yeah. was sagging. I was like, I, he's got to stop at some point, right? He's, he's you have to full. put less no, no, fish no. in there. Yeah, you have to literally feed him less so he doesn't kill himself eating. Crazy. Yeah. 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 <laughs> <laughs> so that like it takes 10 pounds of forage for a largemouth bass to gain one pound. Over okay. a certain period of time or just over the season. I mean, I would hope my bass are growing a pound a year at least. That'd be around here. That's but, you know, most of the lakes, the fish don't grow at all. They're stunted, you know. Um, but in the lakes that they're growing, like one pound a season, if you're seeing that kind of growth, you know, you know that fish ate 10 pounds of forage across that season. And when you bust out, like, this, like you have to look at 10 pounds of two and three inch bluegill. You know what I mean? That's a lot of fish. <laughs> That's a lot of fish. And then, like, you know, some of the fish I grew last year in, um, in the Sugar Hill Outdoors Pond grew two pounds in a year. So, you know, they're sitting at two one, two two right now. And I stocked them last May. They, it's just been one season, you know, because and that's another thing too, like going back to the winter, the fish don't grow in the winter, you know, and fish lay down their their, their scales look very much like if you put it under like a not a microscope, but a, a dissection microscope, you know, with low power, like on 10, um, and look at the fish scale. It takes a little a bit of a dye, a special dye to color it, but um, you can see the, the growth rings on it like a tree. And so they lay down growth rings just like a tree, a scale does. And where the growth rings get close to really close together and kind of make like a, a solid line are the winners because the fish really isn't growing. So you can kind of count the number of winners the fish has been alive. And it's, a, it's not an excellent, there's a better way to age a fish, it's the obelith, the earbone. It's done the exact same way. They cut it in half and count the rings, um, but it's way more. It's way more accurate. Um, but that 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 you're seeing that temperature change in the scale is is what I'm getting at. Since we're talking about temperature, interesting. All right, everybody, we'll jump back in here with Shannon just a second. But first, we've talked about temperature change a little bit throughout this conversation. And one temperature that shouldn't change is the temperature in your cooler. And if you buy one of those cheapos at the store, unfortunately, that's not going to be the case. Or you could spend $500 on a fancy cooler that will work, but it'll require like a line of credit for you to take out to purchase this darn thing. Or here's an idea. You can get the best of both worlds by just buying an Arctic cooler. Arctic, spelled R-T-I-C, gives you the best bang for your buck in the cooler business with their amazing line of hard coolers, soft coolers, and drinkware. No more paying $800 for a cooler or dealing with warm food or warm drinks all day. Arctic is here to help. My personal favorite is that 32-quart ultralight cooler or the 12-can premium soft cooler. Both of those are incredible, and they'll get the job done in any situation. That little 12-can soft cooler is my go-to for the kayak, and that bigger ultralight is my go to for like cookouts, my truck, tailgating, camping, all around like everyday cooler use. And right now you can head over to www.rticoutdoors.com and check out the full line and be sure to go back often because they run new sales like seemingly every week. So keep an eye out, subscribe to the email list so you get the alerts when they run sales that seemingly are too good to be true and trust your time in the outdoors to the best coolers that I've personally ever used. I've been an Arctic customer long before they 
they were a sponsor of this show, and I'll continue to be one long after, I'm sure. They're great folks with a killer product at a price that we can all afford. So head over to www.rticoutdoors.com to check them out and keep the adventure going with Arctic. All right, let's get back to Shan O'Gorman. So this is completely random, but I just thought of it while you were talking. Do you know how long a bass can go without eating? Like, is there, at what mm. point does starvation, I mean, I've seen some fish that look like they haven't eaten in two years, right? They're just, they're mm-hmm. starving and they're withering away, but these fish are so hardy that they just like, they don't seem to die from starvation very often. They just keep living somehow, but can they yeah. make it like a full winter without eating if there's yeah. just, if it's awful? Mm. Great question. And I've, I've seen that before. Um, I've seen ponds actually it happened to me with the aquatic biologist page. This is the last time I've heard about it. I didn't see it personally, but a guy from California hit me up and he said, um, he had a pond out there and he said he had strange behavior. He'd never seen before. And it was bass, eight, eight and nine inch bass jumping and trying to catch dragonflies out of the air. And I said, I've seen that before once. And the guy stocked only largemouth bass in the pond. They had no forage. They're starving. Yeah. Yeah. And they were all eight inches. They never got bigger than eight inches because they couldn't. They didn't have anything to eat. They ate in their own reproduction, if, they, if anything. One, it, it, there wasn't any, really any reproduction anymore. That, that, that pond was about to be lost, but those fish were jumping for fireflies. And I felt really bad, you know, for yeah. them. Um, and I fixed the pond, actually. It, it ended up being okay. But... Um, I told him that I told him that story, you know, I said, the only time I've ever seen that is when there's only bass in the pond. And it turns out the exact same thing had happened in that California pond. Isn't that crazy? God, um, but you're right. I mean, it's, it's, it's absolutely wild that those fish are surviving at all. Exactly. And I wish bass weren't that tough because I've, most of my bass are in such poor condition that if they would die, it would motivate people to do something. But I, now we're going back onto that. They don't understand. They don't understand this thing. You know what I mean? They don't understand. They it, they don't even care. And if the fish aren't floating dead and causing that kind of problem to alert the people, then nothing gets done about it. Yeah, n- no mortality does not mean healthy. Like those no. are two totally different things. It's totally different things. Yes, and that's that's why I, I harp on the relative weight because you know health of a fish can be measured. You know. And I can measure this relative weight, can measure bass, can measure bluegill, can measure red ear, I can do smallies, I can do spots. You know, this is, this is not just something for, for large mouths. So, like, in a pond situation where I'm not primarily working for small lakes, where your primary forage is bluegill and your, and your primary predator is large mouths, and I have these types of charts that tell me bluegill should weigh this, bass should weigh this, okay? So, like you said, you go out to your lake, do they weigh that or do they not? You've just established something with a measurement. You're not making guesses, right? You're not guessing at anything there, all right? You've measured it, and there's a big difference between a measurement and kind of a, 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 a theoretical guess that you've heard from somebody else, you know? Um, when you look at that relative weight and you, you see it, you know it, you know? It's because you measured it. Um, it's much like, uh, I, I don't know, I had a, a conversation once with a guy who was a carpenter, and he said that he could he could look at a bass and tell how much it weighed. He didn't need a scale. And so that's interesting. Can you build a house with no tape measure? And he laughed at me. Of course not. And I was like, and you can't look at a bass and tell me what it weighs accurately enough to do my job either. You have to measure it, and you have to measure it properly. But when you do, you understand a lot. You know, you can get a lot off those little off those little graphs. You know. Um, and again, going back to our temperature and then, then that weight, understanding that the fish are feeding all and, and going into the fall and feeding up and you see that, that bulking up, you know, so go measure those fish at one lake in, in, in Ohio and then go to the, the next lake down the road and you're not seeing fish that heavy, you know, that's giving you information. It's a good point about your relative chart too, is that, and we talked about it earlier, but it's not an excuse what time of year you're measuring that fish as to it's all oh, it's it's june right they just spawned of course they're not gonna it's like no that that's the minimum that's the that's the bare right. threshold of what that fish should be at any condition throughout the entire year if it's above that fantastic good for you but this is the minimum of what it should hit well let's talk about it this way okay so i'm looking at a fish with egg weight right 
let's say, and I just saw this actually, I had a 24 inch fish that had egg weight. Okay. Well, I look at my 24, it should be eight, one on my chart. This fish was like nine, two, but it had egg weight, right? Well, how much egg weight do you think a 24 inch fish has? It's probably going to be like a pound and a half, right? So when it loses that, when it lays those eggs, it's coming back down to that eight, one, eight pounds, safe, safe range, right? Bass bulk up for the spawn, right? So if they bulked up, laid their eggs and are two pounds underweight, that tells you where they started way underweight. Yeah. That's a good point too, that spawn can also mask unhealthy fish. Right. By making them appear as healthy because you're weighing them or you're looking at them at their peak biggest of the year when they should be well above what your relative chart says. And now you're talking about what guys do to me all the time. Well, I caught a 24 inch fish in March that weighed eight, two. I'm like, well, it laid two pounds of eggs and went back down to six, four or whatever. Yeah. <laughs> in terrible condition, bro. You're not paying attention to me. Is the amount of eggs a fish will produce at any point determined by age, or is it just the size of the fish and the weight of the fish? Fish, not the age of the fish, because you can have a fish, those eight inch fish that were stocked with no forage, probably 12 years old, eight inches long. The length of the fish does not matter when they aren't growing properly. Does a fish ever get old enough to lose the ability to reproduce where it's still like alive and healthy and okay? It's just, it's not going to spawn because it's 13 years old? Probably. I would think they uh, probably if that reach at that point they the the stress of the spawning you know will probably we'll kill it probably yeah probably kill it and you get a lot of death in fish populations too like random you get death every day and and that's where your turtles come into play they're they're your garbage compactors they're going to clean that right up they they catch the dead and dying fish um, and they do a real good job of it and that's why you don't see as many dead fish because you have a turtle pop. When, when the fish population starts dying at the rate, the turtle population can't consume it. Now you've got a serious fish kill. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I mean, that's a good point too. When people say, Oh, I didn't see any dead fish. It's like, by the time that fish is dead and floating, something has got that within minutes, right? If it's a hawk, if it's a raccoon, if it's a turtle, something that fish is not going to be there for a day or two. That fish will be there for 10 minutes. And then an opportunistic scavenger of some point is going to take that. So just because you're not seeing the death does not mean the death isn't happening. <laughs> Right. And exactly. And, and and that goes back into like, we had one, I had one post go on and on and on. The guys got into it about bleeding gills, you know, fish with bleeding gills. Those fish generally die. Um, I think the this, this stat they told us in school is about 90% of the time. Wait, you're telling me you can't just pour Mountain Dew on it and they're fine? Yeah, that we had that conversation. <laughs> we don't do that here. <laughs> no, I fish swam off fine. Like I'm sure it did for 30 seconds. Like it's, it's yeah. floating somewhere. Yeah. Yeah. That- that's a that's a good point to make about um when you release fish you know i talk about a lot about fish care you know fish safety just because it swims away doesn't doesn't mean it lived yeah. delayed mortality um, is a thing <laughs> is a very real thing and also too with your stocking you know people stock their ponds all the time and the fish go in the water and swim away and uh and they don't survive and i've seen that many times and People are kind of confused. Like it's like the bad guys in the movies who just fall over dead. You know, <laughs> you know they don't do that. <laughs> it takes a minute. It takes, a, it takes some time. Um, so yeah, a lot of misinformation out there. But that's why I do the page. You know, try to to help smooth some of that over. And I learned about delayed mortality. I think we talked about this in one of the last ones. But the the reason that I learned about it was when I started musky fishing because musky mm-hmm. fishing are one of the most notorious like oh. late later dying fish. Like it swam away fine. Well, you, you fought it on twelve pound fluoro with a one point five crankbait for forty five minutes. That fish is fifteen years old. That fish is definitely dying in about an hour somewhere. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And and again, that's super important depending on where you are. You know, if you're in your backyard pond and your bass are under under their standard weight, I'm going to tell you not even to throw them back. Actually, if you guild one, you've done yourself a favor. Keep it. Make some fish tacos. You're balancing your fishery in the other direction. You know, and that's one thing, too, I run into a lot. People don't understand, you know, like, they hear stuff about lake management. They hear stuff like was done at Lake Erie or whatever, and they want to go do it at their, at their pond. And it's like, no, man, it's the opposite in a pond. You want to make it simpler, not more complex. The more complex you make it, the harder it is to manage, not the easier. It's not Mother Nature fixes all. You want fish that you can control in a pond. 
So you mentioned earlier, too, that obviously you've ran shocking boats before and you've done a lot of electro fishing and that kind of stuff. As we talk about depth, do you see any sort of patterns or anything when you're electro fishing at different depths of what you're typically seeing or pulling up or, you know, when you know that you go over a certain depth point, you're going to be shocking more of this versus this. Do you see patterns or is it just kind of all over the place when you're shocking? Yeah, electro fishing boat is there's a lot of myths around that thing, too. Um, it doesn't catch all the fish. It doesn't even catch it 1% of the fish in a pond if you're lucky to get a survey, you know. It's it just stuns the fish. Um the the fish we always do it at night on the important studies because the fish break up and they're more spread out in the water column and it doesn't really have to do I think it has more to do with light than it has to do with temperature. But they're more loosely associated from the structure after dark. And that makes them because the, the electro fishing service boat is biased. Uh, like anything, everything has bias, right? But um, the electro fishing boat has bias in that it only samples fish maybe like eight or 10 feet deep at the most. Um, if you, any fish in that are going to get away. So if you have a population of fish that live deeper, you're not going to see them at all. Um, you're also like schooling fish. You doesn't really sample crappy very well because they they're all just probably running away by the time you're getting close. Yeah. To it, it. Yeah. It, I, yeah if, if you could put a camera under the, under the, under the water and see what crappy look like or an electro fishing survey, it probably looks like a NASCAR race. Somebody running first and last, <laughs> wherever you are, they're on the other side of the lake. You know, they stay. I've had lakes that I shot two, three years and, I felt like it had crappy because my weights and my bass were subpar um, and I could never do anything about it. And, and then sure enough, three years later, boom, I, I, I find some, you know, I'm like, okay, that makes sense. You know, I got some competition and I'm seeing that in my measurements, you know? So one last thing I had on depth here, as far as I know, in one of our past episodes, we talked about like the zooplankton and the phytoplankton, all that kind of stuff. And like, obviously it's the the start of the food chain where you have these little tiny microscopic things that get pushed around by the wind and they get pushed around by current. And then obviously bait fish follows them, predatory fish follow them. How does depth affect phytoplankton? Like I have to assume that, or zooplankton, I don't know the actual technical terms here, but you know, light can only penetrate water for so long. And I'm sure they need obviously the light for uh, the, I should know this, this is like third grade, um, photosynthesis. Yeah. Jeez. Um, they need that. So is it different from different depths and is it also different for different like clarities of lakes? I have to assume that light can't penetrate as far down in a dirtier lake as it does in a clear lake. Correct. You, 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 you've got it all right. I mean, you nailed it. Um, so there's, there's, there's to break the plankton up into two categories. There's phyto and that's the one with the chlorophyll. You know, it's like a plant that floats around in the water. It's microscopic. Um, you know, just just put a pond put, put pond water on a microscope slide and look at it. You'll, you'll you'll see it. It's green and it's weird looking. You know, and then there's little kind of like bug looking creatures that that live in there too. You'll see them. That's the zooplankton and zoo meaning like you know zoo or animal plankton. And they they consume some some are predators. You know, like just like bass and eat other zooplankton. And some are like eat just foragers and and eat like uh, you know, other like eat the eat the phytoplankton. Um, there's an, a very dynamic food web there. Hundreds of species of each. You could get a PhD just in plankton, right? Um, and, and then a whole another entire world, you know, microscopically. <clears throat> so, you know, that now we're getting again subjective, like. Lake Lanier is a great example because it's it's the most interesting thing. I, the, I just talked to the biologist about I did a talk for um, a local guy in Atlanta. I, I was invited to do, a, uh, it was like a fishing, like the thing you were at. Up oh, in, like a um, seminar. Yeah. You like did a like an expo. I, I, yeah. 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 I did that for the guy. And I, I, I called the, um, it was it was about Lake Lanier. He fishes out there, a guided guy out there. So I called the, um, you know, the biologist and I just got some, got some random info on the lake, you know? So it was like just the same lake that I used earlier, the 45 foot, um, thermocline, right? Yeah. Okay. So this is crazy. <laughs> light can penetrate 45 feet because it's a huge lake and it's clear water in Georgia. We have like, it's a Highland reservoir. So it's super clear. So you get deep light penetration. So you get 
you know, the plankton can collect light so it can live down there. Okay. Well, 45 feet is deep, right? And at 45 feet deep, water is really cold, right? And now we draw that imaginary line right there, and there's actually multiple thermoclines in linear because that's where it gets really complicated. You can have multiple ones in bigger lakes. Um, One, one's but, complicated enough for me. I know, multiple. right? <laughs> I'm, 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 I barely understand it well enough to even speak on it, but this is really cool. So water that's water that's colder is more dense, right? It's heavier. It stays at the bottom, Okay. So when you get a, a thermocline, what you're dealing with is layered water, like a layered cake. Like if, imagine we make a two layer cake with icing in the middle, right? And the top layer is our, our like our vanilla layer, right? And it's whitish, tannish, whatever. That's our oxygen layer. And then we have the this icing layer, and then we have like a chocolate layer, and that's our our, our hypolimnon, is what it's called, and it's a hypolimnion or something like that. And it has no oxygen down there, basically, um, because the light's not down there. And that line is created in between the two is the thermocline. Okay. And so literally the warm water layer rides that temperature keeps it above the thermocline. So that water doesn't mix. The cold water stays at the bottom. The warm water stays at the top all summer long. Okay. They're two different layers of water, just like two different layers of cake. They stay right there all summer. And then the temperature keeps them apart. And up north, you guys, like, so when the temperature cools off at the top, then they mix, right? When the temperature gets close, that's yep. a <laughs> turnover, okay? Yeah. So that warm water layer just mixes with the two. Okay, now in Lanier, this is crazy, dude. The thermocline is so deep at 45 feet that the layer of water there creates a false bottom. And the plankton that dies and the epilimnion falls down on the thermocline, but doesn't go to the bottom of the lake. It sits on the thermocline and rots like it's sitting on the bottom of a pond. And rotting is oxygen consuming. So the rotting plankton is consuming the oxygen on the thermocline in Lake Lanier. What? Yeah. So they've literally, you can take an oxygen meter and drop it down to hit that spot and there will be, and it's really bad for the striper. They're having problems with the striper because the striper want to hunt on the thermocline. It's cold down there. They need that cold water. There's no oxygen down there. So the striper are actually going under the thermocline because, again, big lake is different than smaller. There's actually oxygen down there. It's higher under the thermocline than in the thermocline because of the rotting process that's consuming the oxygen above it. That's wild. So at a lake like up here where we have, because I mean, you will have your electronic show a false bottom sometimes on thermoclines and stuff. At Lanier, it was because of the the rotting plankton down there. But up here, it's just the temperature. There's We're not seeing that up here either. Right? You won't like, see that. Our false bottom is not plankton. Our false bottom is temperature. Your false bottom is you're seeing, yeah, the, the depth finder is reading that, is seeing that density. It's It's seeing that density change. If that makes sense. And it's almost, it's pinging off that. But then in Lanier, you actually have a false bottom because you have all this it's rotting plankton down there. It's literally a false bottom. Yeah. And the plankton that dies, lives its life cycle, dies, sinks, doesn't go through the thermocline and creates this dead zone of oxygen right above the thermocline. And I've never heard of that, never seen that with an oxygen meter. Like that's a freaky thing going on there. Like in a pond, it's very simple to find the thermocline if it's deep enough to even have one. Yeah. Um, it go, you drop the oxygen meter below it and just bottoms out to zero practically. You know, you won't have any fish under the thermocline in a pond normally or a small lake because you don't get that complex whole big lake. It's not a big lake. It's not the same thing. So around us, that would be the place where it's like too deep to fish in the summertime, right? Would be somewhere where you've got below a thermocline, like. Correct. You're wasting I would your not, time. Yeah. Yeah. Don't go under the thermocline. Um, I had a guy do that once. He had like a 20 acre lake he built and he built it like his favorite corner of his favorite reservoir. And he brought, I mean, he brought loaders, dug it 38 feet or whatever deep, but it was only 20 acres. And I'm like, let me guess, you boys don't, it's tw at 20 acres, you'll probably see a thermocline in about, I don't know, maybe 12 feet. 10, 12 feet, somewhere right so there. So it's useless. So you've yeah. got 20 feet of water that they don't even, the fish don't even live in. And see, now you've got a serious problem because let's think about that layered cake again. It's easier to visualize that way. Let's make 
the chocolate layer with no oxygen, eight inches thick. And the upper layer, the 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 top layer with the oxygen, our wider layer, like you see what I'm saying, what I'm talking about. We've got a thick bottom layer with no oxygen and a thin top layer with oxygen. Turn over there, boom, dead. Because you have a higher volume of water with low oxygen, it'll diffuse the oxygen across and kill everything. And that's how turnovers kill fish. And you have it only happen on a deep lake usually. Is that what happens when we have like big shad kills around here in the wintertime? Like, can they just not deal with the turnover? Is that what well, it is? Well, shad are different too, man. Or is it they just because they're pansy little they're, uh, fish that can't can handle be. the temperature change? <laughs> yeah, they can be. And that's a good, I'm not exactly sure about that because you will get the shad die offs due to temperature. You know, like just like it can, it can whack them somehow. And it's just, yeah, I've seen lakes around here where you can like, you can walk around the lake and it's ankle deep in dead shad. Like, I mean, it's just right. these, and they're big ones too. It, it, big ones. The weirdest part is that the shad kill usually affects these giant fish and the little ones are fine off somewhere. It's just these yeah. giant 12, 13 inch gross gizzard shad that all died at once. Right. And that's an indication that you are kind of bumped towards too many shad. You're in the high, too much forage, and they're just old. And those big giant ones, again, the, the, the smaller ones are the younger ones, so they can handle the, the problems. But the older ones get zapped because, you know, they're just old. Well, cool. Hey, before we let you go here, too, I know obviously you talked about you're down in Florida right now. You got some forward facing sonar. What's on the horizon for aquatic biologists in the next like couple months or year? Oh, I got a lot going on, man. Um, yeah, I just had an opportunity. Um, I found a little fish camp place kind of down here. And my place back in Georgia um, was paid, you know. And um, I was never anticipating moving from there because I like having no mortgage payment. Yeah, it's sweet. <laughs> <laughs> but I got an opportunity to sell a place. And I went looking around and I found this little place down here, little Fort McCoy. It's, I'm in the, dude, I am in the woods. But I am a thousand feet from Rodden Reservoir. I am about 30 miles from Orange Lake. I'm about 30 miles from St. John's River. Um, about four, uh, about three hours from the Headwaters Lake down there that is actually crushing right now, dude. I'm going down there. I'm right now. I'm in the process, still, you know, getting everything. I, I fish. I try to fish every day, but um, at least half a day while I'm moving and stuff. But um, yeah, it's it's been real interesting. So I'm I'm gonna take all that, and I, actually, I'm only an hour from some pretty decent snook over the Halifax. I'm going to be doing a little more, you know, maybe, maybe branched out a little more multi-species stuff and, um, and, and posting about the things that I'm learning about, man, because I tell you, I'm in a different world, you know, I've, I've out of my element. I am not, I've, I'll, uh, I'm not going to big time anyone, dude. I am not doing well. Uh, we caught one fish today um, the, in a lake that the, the guides are catching 30 a day. You know, I'm getting smoked right now. Um it's very strange, man. Have you ever seen these floating mats? Think about it like this, right? Like the weeds are only on the surface. Under them is free. They float with their roots hang down. And it's this thick mat of vegetation. So you look like you're on the edge of the lake, but on the edge of the mat, you're in eight, nine, 10 feet of water. And there's 300 yards before you get to the edge of the lake that you can't get to because of the mat. How thick are these things? Like you need a two ounce weight to try to punch the gaps Ooh. to get it under. That's what the guys, that's what punching is. They take one ounce and two ounce Texas rigs and, and um, yeah, you pin them and flip that weight up in the air. So it punches that mat and it gets your bait through. And then you're on 65 pound braid, you hook them and just moose them up through that hole. I'm not good at it. <laughs> we don't do that around here. <laughs> no, no, I don't know what I'm doing and I'm not, I've never really shiner fish before. You know, I'm not really a live bait fisherman, but these Florida bass are so finicky and I'm on a, such a high pressure reservoir. Like I said, I've got guided guys just pounding them with shiners every day. Um, really, really tough artificial bite. I will, you want to come down here and catch fish you know, on artificial? You're the man, dude. You'll like, work for it. <laughs> it. You are going to work. I have put the tackle box in the wind, son. I'm talking one fish a day. 
I know it sucks, but like that's kind of where it's fun, though, too, because you branch out, you challenge yourself a little bit, like you were talking about earlier, right? If you're getting into fishing for just having success all day long, one, you're not going to stick with it. You're going to last about a week because that's not how fishing goes. And two, you're not going to enjoy it. Like the fun part is trying to figure it out and struggling a little bit and going through it and not just having some guide go out and put you on a fish, right? That's why we all love this thing. And I know you're like me where it's just tinkering. It's your mind going all the time. It's how can I get an advantage? Manage, how can I change this? What can I do here? So I know you'll figure it out at some point. It's frustrating, I'm sure, but uh, it'll be worth it, it when you do. Yes, yes. I mean, well, I would think that like most of our avid anglers that listen would know. You know, if you don't enjoy the process, you're in the wrong. You're you're doing it wrong. You know, but it's been tough, man. The other day, I'm fishing my buddy Mickey, and um, and he, I'm again the tackle box. We're not fishing the shiners, you know. We're not marinating shiners. We're, we're fishing, and and I'm zeroing. You know, I'm not even a stripe. Nothing, nothing. Just like there's no, like you're casting into a swimming pool, and he's catching fish and jerk baits. Now, I threw every jerk bait in my box. There's like one particular jerk bait that they would eat, and we had one. You know. And he was wanting me to fish with it. I'm like, no, absolutely not. You fish with it. You're here. You know, I can do this anytime, you know? Um, Darn sure going to go buy fish. one of these jerk baits afterwards. <laughs> oh, absolutely. I went and got, <laughs> I went and got about 11, 110 juniors after that <laughs> and threw it all day today and didn't get a bite. He caught 11 fish to my zero and um, on one bait. And I, I couldn't buy a bite, man. It's, it's, it's crazy strange, but. And this takes us back full circle to what we talked about at the beginning of this, where it's everybody wants these easy answers. Everybody wants these black and white, cut and dry. This is the color 110 junior jerk bait that they'll mm-hmm. eat. And it's like, no, that's what they eat on Tuesday. It's not what they're going to eat on Wednesday. That's yeah, why fishing is fun. We can, we can have these conversations where you try and bolster up your knowledge a little bit more so that hopefully you have a better chance of putting together the puzzle. But there's no right or wrong way to put together the puzzle every day, which is why we like doing what we do. Yeah, exactly. Um, just try to get the probability in your favor a little bit more, like we talked about earlier. You know, that's all, I think that's the, all you can do. Just You're buying two to- lottery tickets instead of one. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> well, cool. Well, hey, I appreciate you stopping by today. Um, real quick, plug the folks where they can find you and where they can keep up with you. Because if you want, I've said this a billion times on the show, but if you want to look at a picture or look at a video or look at a Facebook post and actually have something to read and digest and take something away from shan's your guy so where can folks find you at uh go by aquatic biologist on instagram facebook and youtube well everybody that is our conversation with the one and only shan the man mr shan o'gorman shan thanks so much thank you andrew All right, everybody, there you have it, a long overdue conversation with our favorite aquatic biologist, Shan O'Gorman. So thank you again, Shan, for stopping by and dropping a few knowledge bombs on us, and thank you to each and every one of you that took the time to listen to this. If you're listening to this, I'm fairly confident when I say that you're probably in like the top four or five percent of anglers that are truly invested and interested in learning about the sport, getting better, increasing your knowledge base, and then taking steps to get better and to kind of give you an edge. If you can sit down and absorb what Shan just discussed, as weird as it sounds, you should be proud of yourself because in today's day and age in fishing where everybody just wants to chase like hypey lures or influencers or Instagram likes or whatever, you took the time to sit down down and listen to an hour plus of true nitty gritty nerdy biology talk to give you an edge and I think that should be commended so kudos to you guys it's no wonder that you know I get so many messages and pictures from you guys about your fish catches and how much you say you're improving this kind of episode is why this is how you get better so I'm just pumped that we now live in a day and age where you know we have the internet and podcasts and YouTube where you can go down all of these avenues to soak up information and learn without technically having to like shove your nose in a textbook. And so you can make yourself better by just listening on the drive to work or while you're riding your bike or working out or prepping tackle or whatever you're doing, you are taking that step by listening to this type of thing, which I think is awesome. So a little sappy there, but all of that to say, thank you for listening. I appreciate all of you. Sneak peek, 
I am working on merch. So yes, your emails and your messages have been answered. I'm working on sourcing out the right production to make sure that we get it right. I don't want any of these like cheap, weird t-shirts that still cost you $25 and don't fit right and they feel like they were $4. I don't want some cheap, weird hats. I want all of it to fit right. I want the right design, the right stitching, and uh, I just want to make sure that obviously it's something that we're proud of before we put it out there. So it might take a hot minute, but rest assured, I am working on it. So we're going to have some merch here pretty soon. All right, folks, that's the show today. As always, if you're new here, hit the subscribe button on Apple or Spotify or iHeart, Amazon, Google, wherever you listen to podcasts so you can keep up with us. Leave us a review on Apple or Spotify. That's a huge help. Find us at TackleTalkPodcast.com, Instagram, Facebook. Shoot me a message. I love talking to you guys. And we will see you right back here next Tuesday for another brand new episode of Tackle Talk. Thank you for listening to the Tackle Talk Podcast. Tackle Talk is produced by Andrew Hayes. Copyright 2021. Please subscribe on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you listen to podcasts.